So the PlayStation 5 specs have been announced. We now know what we're dealing with as far as Sony's new console. Hi folks, it's Falcon and today on Game Ranks, the PlayStation 5 full specs revealed. So this morning, Sony did a talk called The Road to PS5, which was originally planned for GDC. And you know, let's just go ahead and say it really showed. This was an immensely technical talk. It was clearly aimed at game developers. However, it was actually incredibly informative. We were able to glean a lot of context from it. And in truth, the path they've decided to take with this thing is very interesting. And if they deliver on all of the numbers that they say, there's a real possibility that in some respects, they do outperform what is technically a more powerful system in the Xbox Series X. It is extremely important to remember that they're telling us what they want us to think about this system. Yes, it was aimed at developers, so it's a little bit less markety. But that being said, this is of course obviously still in its own way an advertisement for the PlayStation 5. I am going to be bringing up the specs that the Xbox Series X has as we talk about the PlayStation 5. It's basically unavoidable to compare these things at this point, but there's some discussion that goes along with the disparities in some of these numbers that I think is actually really interesting. So starting off with our CPU, the PlayStation 5 has eight Zen 2 cores running at 3.5 gigahertz a piece. However, these are running at something they're calling variable frequency. What that is, is they keep the power consumption the same all the time and adjust the frequency that the cores are running at rather than the power consumption. This allows them to have a consistent cooling solution. It also allows apparently for gains in efficiency that will result in better performance which is important because Xbox Series X is running a similar situation except without that variable frequency. Xbox Series X is eight Zen 2 cores at 3.8 gigahertz a second, so it's a little bit higher, but time will really tell, I think, the difference between these two types of technology, how they handle. It may end up being that the PlayStation 5 outperforms, it may not. Now the GPU employs a similar variable frequency situation, and comes in a little short of the Xbox Series X's 12 teraflops, as well as number of CUs, with the PlayStation 5 number of CUs coming in at 36, while the Xbox Series X at 52. However, Sony is claiming that their CUs have about 62% more transistors, so it's a rough equivalent to about 56 PS4 compute units. So keep in mind some of these numbers aren't one-to-one -one comparisons with the Xboxes. That being said, the GPU can apparently run at a very high frequency, 2.23 gigahertz, which is actually quite a bit higher than the 1.825 that we see from the GPU on the Xbox Series X. PlayStation 5, like the Xbox Series X, is running an RDNA 2 GPU architecture. That's great. That means ray tracing, that means reflections, that means some pretty cool stuff. A likely very big increase in what we can expect from the graphics which of course is ultimately what makes another console generation appealing, right? Memory is 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 with a consistent memory bandwidth across the board at 448 gigabytes a second. That contrasts with the Xbox's split bandwidth, for lack of a better term. Some of the Xbox's memory is at 560 gigabytes per second. Some of the Xbox's memory is at 336 gigabytes per second. Having one universal speed may be better because in theory, you're really only as fast as your weakest link. So if data intermingles between the two speeds on the Xbox's memory bus, it's all gonna end up being restricted by that 336 gigabytes per second speed. This is all in theory, but it may be that the 448 gigabyte speed across the board on the memory of the PlayStation 5 is actually an advantage. We shall see though. Now we're at a definite disadvantage as far as hard drive space. The PlayStation 5 is running a custom 825 gigabyte SSD. It is a blisteringly fast drive running at 5.5 gigabytes per second with raw data that is uncompressed and with the type of compression that both the PlayStation 5 and PlayStation 4 use, we're talking about actually eight to nine gigabytes of data. This is actually significantly faster than the data traveling speeds on the Xbox Series X. Xbox Series X is gonna be seeing 2.4 gigabytes raw, 4.8 gigabytes compressed. We're talking 5.5 gigabytes raw, roughly 0.7 gigabytes per second faster than the compressed totals on the Xbox Series X. In Mark Cerny's talk, he wasn't even just talking about eliminating load screens, but having loading be so fast, you could have a very detailed world loading on the fly as you're traveling through it. This is something that actually does go on now, but while you're walking through a tunnel or a canyon, something winding or taking an elevator ride, 
that kind of stuff would just be done with. You'd be loading the world as far as you could see while you're looking at it. For instance, Spider-Man in the PS4 game had capped speed because the game couldn't load the city fast enough. Don't get me wrong, it has an incredible sense of speed, but Spider-Man 2 on PS5 theoretically would allow for much faster, much more incredible sense of speed. The same thing would go for Grand Theft Auto 6 or any other open world game. In theory, the speed that you would be able to go at while quickly loading large areas of the map would be significantly increased. And the PlayStation 5 is also going to be using two types of compression. Zlib, which is the one that PlayStation 4 also uses, and a new Kraken format that offers an additional 10% of compression. This is all going to be done through hardware, and effectively, this could be kind of the boon for the PlayStation 5, given that it has a couple of specs that are actually on paper less than the Xbox Series X. If data is traveling at these rates, load times are gonna be just absolutely unbelievably short, if not possibly non-existent, if developers play their cards right. The numbers Mark Cerny put forward during the course of his presentation are basically utopian. They're amazing. What they said they can accomplish on the PlayStation 5 as far as load speeds, I'm actually quite skeptical of because it sounds so good. And frankly, I'm not even sure if they have to pull off fully what they said here, if they give us 75% of it, if we're loading in, you know, a couple seconds, it's still going to be better than the Xbox Series X's load times. Again, if the information we've been given today holds, it may be that they've come up with a smarter architecture to create an experience for a gamer that's just overall better, rather than gone with just blunt force. Until we see it running, obviously we can't say anything, but if I were to speculate as to the primary advantage of the PlayStation 5 versus the Xbox Series X, it's this. Now, like I said, we've got that 825 gigabyte SSD. That's smaller than the Xbox Series X's terabyte. They have a similar scheme cooked up as far as having a slot for expansion cards or expansion SSDs, I don't know. You'll be able to add another NMVE SSD which matches the specs of the internal one. Sony will have specifications, so they said don't run out and buy one yet, just a heads up. You're gonna need one of the faster M2 SSDs available. Also, external USB drives will be supported. However, these are technically slower drives, and they're only used to play PS4 games through backwards compatibility, not PS5 games. So like the Xbox Series X, you're gonna need to use their custom SSD speeds to take advantage of the new generation, and other USB drives will be used simply for storage and, of course, for previous-gen games that were built on lower speeds. Unlike Xbox Series X, though, you don't have to buy Microsoft's proprietary memory storage here. Like I said earlier, you'll be able to pick up a regular approved M2 SSD and add it in, which gives you a little bit more freedom. As far as the optical drive goes, we're looking at the exact same thing that the Xbox Series X has, a 4K UHD Blu-ray drive. Now, I think a very interesting thing that we have seen here is that Sony hasn't really put forward a performance target statistic where Microsoft has with the Xbox Series X. They target 4K at 60 frames per second, up to 120 frames per second. That being said, the extremely bold claims Sony has made about load times may just be the thing that actually makes the difference. Another thing, we got some in-depth talk about the backwards compatibility on the PlayStation 5. It's pretty darn good. We're fully compatible with PlayStation 4, and the belief is that almost all the top 100 played PlayStation 4 titles will be playable on day one of PlayStation 5. That's, of course, a really welcome thing to hear. They said it will obviously be rolling out games as they are tested individually. That's exciting. I really like the idea that I don't need to have the PlayStation 4 plugged in to play all the PlayStation 4 games. Now, our very last aspect that we need to talk about is 3D audio. This is actually something Sony has decided is one of their more massive priorities for this generation. And the philosophy underlying with it, I actually agree with a lot. They wanted to create a type of audio that basically tricks your brain into feeling like the sounds are happening around you. Audio immersion can do a lot to make visual immersion seem more, well, real. To accomplish this, they've created something called the Tempest Engine, which is kind of another GPU that's acting as an SPU, sound processing unit, which is a big jump over the PlayStation 4 just using a single core to deliver 7.1 surround. The PS3 had a dedicated SPU, and this new unit, the Tempest Engine, 
is capable of giving different audio to different users. It uses a profile called an HRTF, which to be clear is different for every single person. They're using sort of averaged ones in order to ensure that you get something that works for you. They'll give you a choice between five different ones at the start, but it's actually going to be something that develops over the course of years. The intent is to deliver more locality to sound so that sound is more easily identifiable as happening in a specific spatial area. According to Mark Cerny, there's going to be the ability to have literally hundreds of different sources for sound as far as locations, where traditionally on the PS4, there's kind of two, you know, with stereo, or, you know, a few more if you've got surround. He kept saying he believes it's an incredibly impressive bit of technology and does a lot to fool the player into feeling like they're actually in the world they're observing on the television. I love the sound of that, no pun intended. And in truth, I think that we really have an interesting, completely different design philosophy with the PlayStation 5 that we do with the Xbox Series X. PlayStation 5 is looking to maximize the efficiency of components that are slightly less powerful overall than the Xbox Series X, but possibly able to be utilized better. Now, again, there's even things that I'm a little bit skeptical about right now, particularly that uh, utopian load time claim. But in truth, seeing these two different design philosophies face off is going to make for a really interesting console generation. I'm really excited for both personally. But there's some gambles that the PlayStation 5 is making that I think are a little bit more interesting, and I really want to see how they play out. What do you think? Leave us a comment, let us know. If you like this video, please click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time, right here on Game Ranks.